evening, uh, everybody. Um, and uh, for people who are from Europe, good afternoon. Uh, it's, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Mahindra from National University of Singapore. Uh, I think I'm sure all of you know him. Um, so I just give you a very formal, short introduction about his career. Uh, he has obtained his uh, Master of Science from University of Hyderabad. Then he moved to Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore for his PhD. Uh, he obtained his PhD in 1997. Then he was a postdoc and a senior researcher uh, for about seven years at different places in Spain, France, US, Japan. And uh, he moved to National University of Singapore since 2005 uh, as an assistant professor initially. And in 2012, he became an associate professor in the same place where he's currently working. He has uh, made really high impact, um, high quality publications, uh, more than 165 publications and uh, nearly 5,200 citations. He has got several recognitions uh, starting during his PhD time. He got the uh, Thulu's medal for best thesis in chemical sciences from IIC Bangalore in 1997. Uh, he got the Young Investigator Award in uh, NUS in 2007. And uh, he was the co-chair of the Spintonics Focus Group at NUS. Uh, his research area actually covers uh, broad spectrum. Uh, starting with oxide spintronics, energy conversion, multiferroics, magnetic alloys, and uh, today you will talk uh, about this uh, oxides, the high frequency transport in oxides. Um, he has also a hobby that's very nice, and that is developing experimental tools for education. So, with all this, uh, I like to formally welcome Professor Mandra uh, to this. Uh, uh, webinar and uh, welcome all of you. A uh, small note, uh, there may be some newcomers to join this webinar. Uh, kindly note that during the webinar, we do not take any questions. So if you have some uh, pressing question, you can immediately write in the chat window. And at the end of the lecture, we will take all the questions one by one. So with this, uh, I uh, welcome Professor Mohanlan to start his webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhanga. Um, so, so good evening, good morning, or good afternoon to all, depending upon where you are. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Shubhanga and uh, Bridge Bhushan Das for arranging this uh, seminar series. Uh, I have been listening to this uh, series from the beginning, except I missed probably few. It's a very useful series to know what other people are doing and also to have interaction. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk a very simple uh, uh, results based on a simple experiment. Basically, what do we learn from high frequency magnetotransport transport in oxides? Okay, first, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, students and postdocs. The Ushnish did most of the, his work. Uh, right now, he's, uh, yeah, I think, a month before he has moved to Micron. And Amit is now a postdoc in, um, in the US. Dr. Rajesh Tridas is a postdoc in the lab and uh, Lee Hong is a student. So right now only there are two students, uh, two, two people in the lab. And these are some of my past students. Some work was done by Pawan and Ruby. Ruby is a postdoc in Netherlands and Pawan is a research scientist in ESTAR in Singapore. Um, initial work was done by Alvin and Vinay. Unfortunately, I do not have their photographs and they are in global foundries in Singapore. So most of my students are working in industry. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Okay, so to start with, um, oh, now it got stuck. Yeah, well, so my lab at NUS started functioning from 2006. Uh, the first funding came around the 2000, end of 2006. So I focus mainly on oxides. Of, of course, also on strongly correlated electron system, um, materials for resistivity switching, multiferroic and uh, magnetoelectrics, uh, 
recent years, I focused on thermoelectrics, particularly Magadol Seebeck effect, anomalous Nernst effect, and so on. In addition, we also work on Magadol striction. A lot of work is being well, done in my lab on Magadol caloric materials, particularly oxides, pressure effect on Magadol caloric effect. And more recently, my interest has turned towards uh, charge spin conversion in oxides. Uh, so this is uh, with respect to this, I'm talking today on the high frequency transport in this uh, ox some of these oxides. So in addition, I collaborate with other groups on usual alloy, antiperoskites, magnetic shape memory alloys, and magnetic nanoparticles. As uh, Subhangar mentioned, I love doing uh, fun experiments. So most of the time I'm in the lab, even on Saturday and Sunday, uh, even though my students are not there sometime. Okay. Um, well, so this is a uh, yeah, view of my lab. It's a very small lab. So you can see that there's, a, there's a one dedicated system for studying thermoelectricity from 350 Kelvin down to 50 Kelvin, uh, which can also measure you know, the impedance of the samples. And then I have one this, at the central part of the lab. Uh, I have the, this is just done in the last one year uh, to study high frequency transport. Basically, I have a vector network analyzer and then Ushnish, uh, who is currently uh, in, uh, um, uh, has moved to the industry, has, uh, he has set up lock-in uh, FMR and also Magato electric measurement for multiforates. And then Magato impedance, anomalous Nernst effect, and the Magato dielectric uh, measurements on the, on the career start uh, on the right side. So we have a VSM, which uh, works only at room temperature at present. Most of our transport measurements are done with the cryostart or the PPMS shown here. And then we also have probe station to investigate um, you know, devices. Well, so these are some representative publications uh, in the last two years. I just selected only a few of them, um, last two or three years. So it shows that the first three papers or four papers are, are connected with the europium titanate, uh, doped with either with the barium or niobium. Why? Europium titanate is a rare um, uh, perovskite, which is anti-ferromagnetic and para-electric. Uh, but when you dope with the barium, it becomes ferromagnetic, and also with the niobium, it becomes ferromagnetic. So we have seen large thermoelectric response comparable to strontium titanate in this compound. And then we also find a colossal magnet resistance, uh, about 100% in 0.2 Tesla, uh, in, in some of these uh, European titanate. Uh, so with my collaborator in Singapore, as well as uh, in, in India, I think it is Aisar Bhopal, Surajit Shah. So we are investigating some, um, you know, ferroelectricity and uh, uh, plasmon in the systems. So also the, this is a recent work a year before we have done an anomalous lens effect in this uh, manganite. Now we have a lot of results to publish in this topic. So in Singapore, we, I collaborate with my friend Adi Kunle Adiyayi, who has, uh, uh, who is an expert in magnonics. So we work on multi-magnetic multi-layers, uh, high, particularly high-frequency transport. So if you can see, the last two, pub, last these three publications, two publications are connected with the um, impact of high pressure on magnetic caloric as well as the structural and magnetic phase transition. And uh, the last one is on the electrical resistivity switching, which was done 10 years before, but now I'm back to this field. Okay, so today's talk is just focused on one material. It's basically one type of material, which is the manganite. Well, I think there was few talks, I think particularly one by, I think, uh, from Aisar Mohali, and uh, I don't remember this, so the another talk also by someone else uh, yeah, on, on oxides. Uh, it's manganites, uh, the formula generally R M N O three, where R is a uh, you know, rare earth or a divalent ion. For example, if I take lanthanum M N O three, it's an antiferromagnetic insulator. Strontium manganite O three is also also as an antiferromagnetic insulator. But the manganese is only trivalent state in L M N O three and a tetravalent state in in strontium M N M N O uh, M N O three. So manganese atoms sit at the corner of the cube as shown here, the blue color, the lanthanum at the center, and the manganese is surrounded by six octahedra, uh, sorry, say six oxygen in the octahedral form. Okay, so the two ends, lanthanum manganite and strontium manganite are antiferromagnetic insulator, 
However, you replace uh, lanthanum with uh, strontium, which has uh, valency two plus, then you introduce uh, holes. So basically you convert manganese three plus, part of manganese three plus into manganese four plus. That is one minus X MN three plus is converted into X MN four plus. So as a result, then the phase diagram changes. As you can see here, CA stands for canted insulator, antiferromagnetic insulator, FI stands for ferromagnetic insulator. Then between composition 0.18 and 0.5, you have a ferromagnetic metal. Okay. Then you increase the hold content, that is MN4 plus content more, then again it changes into antiferromagnetic metal. Well, this you have come across even in the last uh, thing talked by Sunil Nair. Okay. So why are they metallic for certain X values? That is certain hold content. So it was explained by what is known as the Zener's model. So in the Zener's model, first of all, one considers that the effect of crystal field, which splits the, the degenerate level, uh, the five-fold degenerate orbitals into three-fold degenerate T2G level and the EG level. And there are three electrons in the T2G level and a single electron in the EG level. So this is for manganese three plus. So, in this compound, lanthanum strontium manganate, you have mixed valence, valence, that is manganese 3 plus and manganese 4 plus. So what happens? So manganese 3 plus, if you consider this here, so the T2G electron is localized, whereas the EG electron can move. Okay, but now the movement of the EG electrons depends upon the orientation of uh, the magnetic movement, that is T2G movements on both the sides. So you start with manganese three plus on the left side and manganese four plus on the right side. There is no electron at the EG level of manganese four plus. Now you see that initially they are anti-parallel. This MN three plus, the T2G spins are anti-parallel. Now, if they become parallel, uh, uh, this slow, slow in animation. So when, they, when it becomes parallel, then the EG electron can hop to oxygen and simultaneously to the other side. So the MN3 plus becomes MN4 plus and MN4 plus becomes MN3 plus. So the electron hopping is possible or make it easier or other way it's mobility uh, is more only when this uh, T2G spin on both sides of oxygen are parallel. So that is the very important message. So the ordering of T2G spin, a ferromagnetic ordering of the T2G spin can promote the, the charge transfer easily from, from the left side to the right side. So that is the basic mechanism of uh, the electrical conduction and magnetism in, in, uh, in these oxides. Okay, so these oxides become famous. It was discovered back in 1940s, but it became more famous only in uh, 19, uh, uh, become more famous uh, after the discovery of what is known as the colossal magnetic resistance effect in 1990s. So this is an example of uh, colossal magnetic resistance in the lanthanum calcium manganese. So what is shown is the resistivity as a function of temperature under different magnetic fields. So you can see that when the temperature is reduced, the resistivity in zero field increases rapidly first as like a insulator, and then suddenly it drops. So this transition from insulating to metallic state occurs at the same time when the the, the T2G spin order, that is when paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition takes place. But unlike other normal metal like iron or cobalt, the effect of magnetic field is tremendous here. So you apply the magnetic field, for example, one Tesla, three Tesla, five Tesla, you can see that the resistivity peak not only decreases in magnitude, but the peak position also shifts upwards. So this change in the magnetic resistance this change in the resistance under the magnetic field can be 80% to 100% in a magnetic field of 6 to uh, 7 Tesla. Uh, well, there are several exotic phenomena has been found in these materials uh, at, room, at low temperatures, but uh, still, although after 20 years of the discovery, still these materials do not find applications uh, for one reason, that getting magneto resistance in kilo isotered or sub kilo isotered field is still difficult. Okay, so we try to look uh, uh, into uh, a different way of obtaining this. For first, before that, let me tell you uh, another story, uh, the difference between a single crystal and the polycrystalline materials, uh, magnetic resistance in these compounds. Well, so the graph on the left top 
shows uh, magnetic resistance as a function of uh, magnetic field for single crystal the blue color is a single crystal somehow it is shifted uh, it is actually linear uh, over a wide field range whereas the polycrystal example if you see it uh, above one tesla uh, it is linear but below one tesla you can see a rapid uh, drop or rapid increase in the magnitude so this is a very important this is seen only in in, in polycrystals and it has been attributed to uh, spin polarized tunneling of uh, electron from one grain to another grain. So it's a tunneling magnetic resistance, uh, which is dependent on the, the magnetization of these two grains, like what is shown here, and the, the spin polarization given by this P, P parameter P and J is the exchange coupling and the temperature and so on. So the bottom graph shows the resistivity as a function of temperature uh, in the zero field and six tesla the peak as i told that it shut up sips up when the magnetic field is applied and the one the the, the one in the circle basically is the magneto resistance which shows a peak uh, so i'm not able to move my this thing properly well it, the, it shows a peak around the curie temperature and then decreases and low temperature increases this low temperature increase uh, is not seen in single crystal or good quality thin film. So this is mainly due to polycrystalline sample and due to tunneling magnetic resistance. So the advantage of tunneling magnetic resistance is that you can get a large magnetic resistance in low field, less than one Tesla. However, unfortunately, when the temperature is increased, the tunneling magnetic resistance also decreases. So it almost goes to zero as temperature goes to TC. So, so that has been frustrating uh, people for a long time, okay? But continuity of this work in magnet has resulted in many things. For example, you know, the two-dimensional electron gas in some of the oxides and the, particularly the, the beginning of uh, multiferroics that started with the terbium manganite you know, or the byproduct of uh, working in manganites. So here, what we try to do is that uh, initially, uh, first of all, I wanted to know what happens, sorry, what happens to the electron mobility uh, in the presence of uh, AC current instead of DC current? I mean, just a curiosity, okay. Uh, however, there's no theoretical prediction available. And uh, magneto resistance uh, with the AC current has been hardly reported uh, except for few work, which is basically microwave absorption studies uh, done using electron uh, paramagnetic resonance spectrometers. So what we did, this was back in 2009, almost 11 years before. So we tried to measure four probe impedance of a ferromagnetic oxide uh, using the uh, setup, what is shown here. This is a simple four probe method as like you measure the DC resistivity, you pass the AC current through the sample and measure the voltage across uh, these two pads. The setup is uh, shown here. So I have a PPMS, so in which an uh, uh, impedance analyzer or LCR meter is connected and we measure the, the, the impedance, that is Z star, which is the ratio of the, the AC voltage to the AC current, and which is, is basically you can write impedance as the real part and the imaginary part, okay? Real part is the resistance, and the imaginary part is the reactance, okay? So you define the magneto impedance in the conventional way as the ratio of uh, these quantities, Z of H minus Z of H zero by normalized with respect to the impedance in zero field. Fine. So let me see first the result. So this work, as I told, is in 2009. So we what we we focused on low field effect. So the first there are two graphs here. The first graph shows that the resistance measured with in the presence of 0.1 megahertz, that is um, uh, uh, 10 kilohertz. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So so what you see is that the resistance start decreasing when the temperature is lowered and then such a sort of rapid decrease this is occurs around this occurs around the curie temperature and then it decreases uh, like this okay continuously decreases so a magnetic field of 100 millitesla which is 100 millitesla is uh, one kilo oyster so it affects the resistivity but it's if you, as you can see that the, the effect is rather small but what you see if you increase the frequency two megahertz First, very interestingly, the zero field resistance itself shows a very anomalous behavior. 
You see that the resistance initially decreased in the paramagnetic state as like the, the 0.1 megahertz, and then suddenly there is an increase, okay? And then it shows a peak, and then it decreases uh, continuously in the ferromagnetic state. So this peak, the sudden increase coincides with ferromagnetic transition. So that is very interesting. So in the zero field, you have anomalous high, anomalous jump in the resistance, AC resistance. Now, when you apply the magnetic field, you can see that with the ink, when uh, 10 milliliter slice uh, uh, applied, the resistivity peak decreases. If you increase the field uh, intensity, the resistivity peak, what you see here actually, uh, decreases in magnitude and shifts towards lower temperature. And uh, by one kilo state, you do not have peak. So these one kilo state data is uh, similar to the DC resistivity data. Okay, and this is uh, something is puzzling. First of all, at low field, that is less than one kilo state, the resistivity peak is, is strongly affected and the shift towards lower field, sorry, lower temperature. This is in contrast to the previous one, which I showed where the resistivity peak shifts to higher temperature under a high magnetic field, okay? So it seems to be a completely different effect. We were puzzled by that uh, when we saw this thing. Uh, and then we, because we also simultaneously measured the reactant spot. So now the resistance spot is shown here. This is the AC resistance, and this is the AC reactants, same under 0.1 megahertz and uh, 2 megahertz. So you can see the similar behavior. The AC resistance also is strongly affected by, AC reactants also strongly affected by low field. So the peak push and shifts down. Okay. Some of you maybe, or you'd have done on the, uh, experiment something similar to that, but with AC susceptibility. So it should remind you of the behavior of the AC susceptibility under DC bias. Basically, under the DC bias, the peak what you see should usually shifts down like this. So it looks that what we are seeing is actually resembles the AC susceptibility behavior. Okay, uh, so it was it was a bit surprising when uh, why, why did we see this? I mean, this this is back in two thousand nine. Okay, now we calculate the magneto resistance and the magneto reactance and the magneto impedance all are shown here. So as you can see that the magneto resistance at 30 millitesla, which is uh, 300 Gauss, uh, is about 20% and then it increases to about 45% uh, uh, for one kilo state. Okay, and so this AC magneto resistance is the 45% at one kilo state, which is much larger than, uh, or, or it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, I should say it's a more significant compared to the DC magnetic resistance because the DC magnetic resistance is only 35% at seven Tesla and less than 1% under one kilo state. So we could get a, such a huge magnetic resistance under low fields. That was a really a big achievement. Okay, but then this, Magneto resistance value also depends upon the frequency. For certain frequency, it goes through a maximum. Apparently, it starts decreasing. Okay, we could not measure more than five megahertz because we had some problem with the phase in the instrument. The phase was changing after six megahertz, so uh, we didn't continue. Uh, 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 we didn't report what happens after five megahertz. Okay. Now the question comes: What we have seen is it? particular to this double exchange system, which is manganite, or can you see in the other materials? Okay. Well, we have investigated only very few materials uh, uh, as a function of temperature. So here I show one compound, which is a, dub, which is a prosodium strontium cobalt. This is also a ferromagnetic oxide, but there is no double exchange here. So this is a system where ethylene electron play a very important role. Uh, what I see, what I show here on the left graph is the magnetization uh, as a function of temperature under different magnetic fields. So this is a 10 Gauss. You can see that there's a ferromagnetic transition around a 240 Kelvin. Then below the Curie temperature, there is another anomaly. Uh, at that time, it was not clearly understood. I sort of suggested due to some sort of spin re reorientation transition. This what was done in 2003. And this downwards shift changes into upward shift when the magnetic field is increased and uh, some sort of anomaly persists even at the phytosla. Okay, so this is the DC resistance. 
we can see that under zero field, the, there's a change in the slope uh, around the Curie temperature, which is expected in many ferromagnetic materials. But around the low temperature, around 120 Kelvin, where uh, this anomaly takes place in the magnetization, doesn't have any impact on the DC resistivity. Okay. And uh, even under seven Tesla, I don't see any anomaly. So DC resistivity doesn't show any anomaly at the second magnetic transition, which, which he calls a double magnetic transition. Okay. So later, I continued this work uh, when I was in uh, Tokura's group uh, as an Erato fellow, where we did a Lawrence microscopy, and we found that actually there is a spin reorientation transition around this temperature. You can see some sort of stripe pattern here. And then when the temperature is reduced, these are 140 Kelvin and the this is 180 Kelvin, the transition is around 120 Kelvin. You can see that actually the stripe pattern has rotated. So there is a change in the domain structure when you go from low temperature to high temperature due to uh, this spin reorientation transition. It's only in the last two, four years, the origin of the spin reorientation transition is known. Uh, a group in Spain by uh, Blasco et al. They found that actually this is accompanied by structural transition from tetragonal to monoclinic structure. Okay, so how about now the AC susceptibility in this compound? So AC susceptibility shows a sharp increase. <clears throat> this is, uh, and then shows an anomaly here as like the DC, DC magnetization. The impedance measured in zero field, what I show is the, the imagery part, at 100 kilohertz, you can see again the sharp increase, a very weak anomaly around 120 Kelvin, like what you see here. But at one megahertz, again, you have a behavior which exactly matches with the AC susceptibility. So this means that what I have seen in manganite is not unique to manganite. Maybe it's possible to observe in other materials. So currently we, we are investigating other materials, particularly the usual alloys, some of the antiperoskites, we do see similar trend. So it seems that, so it is not connected with the double exchange mechanism. Okay, so what is the origin? Apparently, uh, it seems to be simple to explain, although the details differ. Well, so you are passing AC current through the sample. Okay, consider that the AC is uh, the domain pattern is like something like this. So the flow of the AC current, first of all, create a alternating magnetic field in the direction perpendicular to the current flow. So it's a circular magnetic field. Now this magnetic field should in, will interact with the magnetic domain structure. So it interacts with the magnetization. So the domain wall motion and the domain rotation takes place even with the AC field. But as the frequency of the AC current increases, the AC field increases, the domain wall motion will be damped because of the eddy current. So the domain rotation became a dominant mechanism. So, so what we are seeing should be something connected with <coughs> the change in the high frequency, the magnetic behavior of this sample, okay? So then also when the frequency is increased, we know that there is something called skin effect plays the role because these materials are not insulating. They are more like a semi, you can say the semiconductor uh, or some materials are more metallically scopolite. So the skin effect, you know, basically causes the current to flow only uh, to a layer of thickness uh, known as the skin depth when the frequency increases. So which is the skin depth is related to the, the resistivity of the sample rho and inversely proportional to this uh, permeability, which I call as the mu sub t, where sub t actually stands for transverse permeability because the current, AC current is in the, say if it's x direction, the magnetic field is transverse so, uh, so I say that the, the permeability is also we're considering the transverse component of the permeability. So so point is that both the AC magnetic field and the skin depth both are probably playing the role. Okay, but we have to distinguish them. Uh, still, it's not very clear how to do it. Uh, we will think about it uh, soon. Okay, so the first case is that uh, if you read the Landon Lipschitz book, the high frequency impedance of a metallic conductor can be written for a slab-like geometry, Z equals to R DC KT cottage, cottage KT, where K is the wave vector, and it, T is the off thickness of the sample. So thickness is actually two, two. Uh, so you can, if you write impedance as Z equals to R plus IX. So in the low frequency limit, the skin depth is much larger than that 
the, the thickness of the sample. So the, its current throws, flow, flows throughout the volume of the sample. So then one can approximate this as RDC uh, 1 plus KT square uh, over uh, 3. So which you uh, separate into real and imagery part, you can see that the real part actually has a component mu t double prime, which is the, the imagery part of the permeability. Whereas the, re re the reactant spots as mu prime. Okay, so that's the resistance part can be, you know, resistance can be affected by the behavior of the mu t prime, mu t double prime, and the reactants can be affected by mu t prime if it exceeds the DC value. Now, what about high frequency? If the skin effect is very dominant, okay, when the current is flowing only in 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 a, in a, in a small thickness, then again. The approximation is that uh, Z can be written as RDC uh, 1 plus I rho DC by delta. So the, uh, the solution is that basically the DC resistance multiplied by the square root of uh, mu R minus I square root of mu L. So what is this mu R? Mu R is again, is the resistive permeability or sometimes it's called apparent permeability, which is basically the modulus of the, the permeability plus mu T double prime and mu L is modulus of mu T minus mu T double prime. So basically both resistance and the reactance part are affected by the behavior of mu T double prime and the modulus of mu T. So that is the take home message. Okay, the, my whole story is, is built upon this. So roughly we can say that the, the impedance is proportional to square root of omega mu T. Uh, mu T is a function of the frequency and also the external magnetic field. Okay, now, so far it's uh, about below five megahertz. Now, this is a recent paper in 2019 by us on lanthanum 0.6 strontium 0.4 MnO3 doped with the gallium. Well, it took almost 10 years to think about, actually to get an experiment to do at a higher frequencies where basically we want to know what happens to this AC metal resistance if we go more beyond uh, one six five megahertz and up to few gigahertz. Okay, so why gallium doping? Well, lanthanum strontium manganite. This this particular composition also is a ferromagnetic without gallium with the TC of around the three three seventy Kelvin. When you dope gallium, so the TC shifts down as you can see here. It's shifted down from three sixty Kelvin to for thirty percent of gallium to around two hundred Kelvin. This is because gallium is non-magnetic. And it has the ionic radius uh, uh, somewhat equivalent to manganese 3 plus, so it doesn't affect the, the crystal structure or the lattice parameter very much, but it dilutes the magnetic interaction between manganese 3 plus and manganese 4 plus. As a result, the TC decreases. So, well, now what happens to the resistivity? So that the graph on the right, the, the top graph shows the resistivity of four compositions, x equal to 0 to 0.3. So you can see that the as the, the this thing is uh, composition is increased, the gallium quantity is increased, the resistivity peak what you see shifts down. For 0.1, the peak is around 300 Kelvin. Roughly this peak is equivalent to the TC, but not necessarily always. Um, you will see that one later. But then for X equal to 0.3, the TC has shifted very much down uh, to 200 Kelvin. Uh, although the peak uh, comes at much lower, temperature that is around 150 Kelvin. Okay. Now the bottom one shows the DC magnetic resistance up to 7 Tesla. Of course we are not interested in 7 Tesla, uh, we are interested in low field, but let me first see what happens the, at higher fields. So X equal to parent compound without gallium as a magnetic resistance of about 12% uh, 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 at 7 Tesla and then it increases to 15% for X equal to 0 0.05. 0.1 composition as a magnetic resistance about 25% because the TC of X equal to 0.1 is close to room temperature. That's why it has a large magnetic resistance. So the right side shows the expanded view of this, the low field DCMR. So what you see between 0.3 and the minus 0.3 and the plus 0.3 Tesla, that is 3000 Gauss. So the magnetic resistance uh, for this compound X equal to 0.1 is only 2%. So other two compositions have much lower value. So we, as I told that we are now 
we cannot do this uh, measurement like what we had done previously. That's the temperature dependence because of the problem associated with uh, doing the transport in gigahertz range at low temperature, especially problem with the cables. Okay, so we can find our measurements only to room temperature. Okay, that also makes your life easier. Okay, so the measurement is uh, set up is this. So I have an impedance analyzer, which was uh, bought with the idea of investigating magneto dielectric effect in multiple but now it's mostly used for magneto impedance measurement, what I'm suggesting. So the sample is uh, uh, in, in the, within this uh, electro, the, the, within the poles of this electromagnet. So it is connected to the instrument via this coaxial cable. Uh, so this is the schematic diagram. So consider this, this is the North and South Pole. And this is the coaxial line, which is connected to this impedance analyzer, which is E4991 RF impedance analyzer from Agilent. So it's a signal line. And then this sample basically bridges signal line and uh, the ground. So the current passes through the, the sample and it goes to the ground and then the signal goes. So it's basically a single port instrument. Okay, unlike the VNA, which are two port or you know, four port instrument. So as, you, as I have already mentioned, at low frequency, the current flows uniformly through the sample. Then you have the AC current, AC magnetic field, something like this, circulating like this. But when the frequency increases, the current will prefer to flow only through the skin depth region, like what is shown. So the AC magnetic field also will be confined to this region. Okay, this is where the interesting aspect comes in. So we measure the impedance as a function of frequency and the DC magnetic field is swept. Okay, so what is the result? Well, so this is uh, looks a very interesting picture. So I show here for five compositions. So you can see that this was the parent compound, which is ferromagnetic with a Curie temperature 360 Kelvin. So what I plot is the, the magneto resistance as a function of magnetic field and also when the frequency is varied. So you can see that the magneto resistance at the highest field is about minus 10% or something here. Uh, then it shows a single peak uh, for low frequency. The highest frequency is one megahertz. So when the frequency increases, you can see that actually there is a, a sort of double peak structure develops. And then this double peak structure moves towards higher field. And this is common in all the samples. But what is interesting is that like, so basically you form a canal like pattern, the height of the canal and the depth of the canal now depends on the composition. First of all, when the composition changes, you also change the TC. So particularly for the composition gallium 0.1, which is the TC is close by, you have the future corresponding to the ferromagnetic sample and then this paramagnetic sample. But this was somewhat unexpected because you see that suddenly, for gallium point one for this thing, the, the, the peaks are somewhat closer to origin, but then this for paramagnetic sample, gallium point one, gallium point three, actually it, it widens, the canal widens. Uh, it, it was, we didn't expect at all. First of all, we didn't expect to see a signal in, uh, uh, in, in the paramagnetic state. And also we didn't expect to see this double peak signal at all uh, when we started the experiment. Okay. so. Well, this graph, this picture basically shows that a similar behavior is also seen in the reactant. This is the resistance part and the reactant part. Uh, so this is the resistance and the reactants. Basically, you see the futures both in the resistance and reactants, although sometimes it's more prominent in the resistance part. Okay, so, so we'll focus only on the, the magneto resistance. So this graph shows that the top graph shows the, the value of the magneto resistance. Uh, because there are too many graphs uh, that I'll just um, uh, uh, I'll just focus only on one composition that is x equal to 0.1. So you can see that the magneto resistance almost started from about 15% or something. It went to a maximum of about 55%, around 100 megahertz. And then when the frequencies further increase, the magneto resistance value it, uh, sort of decreases. First of all, the sign changes from negative to positive. So this corresponds to basically this peak positions. You see these peaks are basically positive magnetic resistance. Okay. So if we plot this uh, peak magnetic resistance, actually it is 75% at 2.5 kilohertz. You see that it's a very high value compared to the DC magnetic resistance. 
So, whereas the magnetic resistance is uh, still small, but uh, much, much, much larger than the DC magnetic resistance in this paramagnetic sample 0.2 and 0.3. Okay. So, what about the graph on the right side? So, this basically I collect the peak position where the magnetic resistance shows a peak and then plot it as a function of frequency, frequency on the y axis and then the peak position, the magnetic field corresponding to the peak position on the x-axis. So for different compositions. So you can see that 0.2 and 0.3 are paramagnetic samples. They are linear. So basically, uh, it, basically, sorry, the, 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 the peak occurs at a much higher field compared to ferromagnetic sample, which are this. And the ferromagnetic sample shows some sort of nonlinear behavior at a, uh, higher frequencies. Okay, we'll come back to this one soon. First, we like to see what is the correlation between magneto resistance and the magneto reactance. Okay, first focus on the, the, the graph on the right side. Again, there are too many graphs, no need to bother. So just guess the message. So basically, the red curve is for the magneto resistance, which shows a double peak. Okay. On the other hand, the blue curve is for the magneto reactant spot, which actually shows at zero field, it shows a maximum and then shows a, a dip. So this dip and this peak, dip in magneto reactants and the peak in magneto resistance, they occur in different fields. But when the composition is increased, you can see that actually they, the, the dip moves towards the uh, higher field. And in the, the paramagnetic composition, 0.1, 0.3, they are very close to the field where the, the peak in the magnetic resistance occurs. But to see it more clearly, we take the differentiate, we differentiate magnetic resistance uh, with respect to the magnetic field and plot it. So this is dMR by dH, and this is the magneto reactance. And you, now you can see a nice correlation. The, the dip we see in the magnetic magneto reactance coincides with the derivative, the, the, the minimum and the maximum of the derivative of the MR. You see here? So this shows a very clear correlation occurs between uh, these two properties. So just studying one of them uh, is sufficient. And it's particularly for X equal to point, which is the, the paramagnetic sample, whose this is 200 Kelvin, the match is very nice. Okay, now, so what is the origin? which I already mentioned that one, one possible origin, this is not the, the, the complete uh, understanding yet, is that at high frequency, the current try to flow only along the surface, okay, through the, like what is shown here. So the high frequency resistance or reactance is dominated by the transverse permeability, particularly for resistance, it's a mu R, which I shown here as the, the modulus of uh, the, uh, the permeability plus mu T double prime, and the, the inductive reactance, which is the, the inductive permeability, which dominates the, the, the reactance part. So, so basically the resistance is dominated by the, the mu T double prime, okay. Um, so if you take my word, then let us see what happens. Well, so there are some results, but not on oxide, but on amorphous ribbons by, uh, particularly by a group from Japan uh, and then a group, a group from Spain, they actually found uh, that when, if they take a ribbon, if the easy axis is uh, along the DC magnetic field, or the DC magnetic field is along the, found, applied along the easy axis, they found that the impedance shows just a peak around zero field, but when the easy axis is perpendicular to the DC magnetic field, a double peak structure is observed. And this peak where it occurs is uh, corresponding to the, the anisotropy field. Okay, so the cal detailed calculation done by some group, I just referred to only to this paper, where the DC magnetic field is applied along uh, uh, the X axis like this, and the AC magnetic field along the Y axis. And suppose the easy axis makes an angle theta K, and the magnetization makes an angle theta. So, so this paper calculate, uh, you know, unit, unit all, they calculated the behavior of the transverse susceptibility or permeability, and then they plotted this. So which says that there's a double peak structure occurs when the easy axis is perpendicular to the DC magnetic field. 
particularly if the peak is the peak magnitude is more when the easy access coincides with the, the AC field direction. Okay, so the double peak is connected with the, the domain rotation, whereas the domain wall motion is important uh, uh, at low frequencies and that leads to a single uh, uh, peak in zero field. So that is the main message. Okay. Interestingly, when uh, back in 96, there was a paper which tried to connect between magneto impedance and the ferromagnetic resonance. Okay, so this paper basically so what we observed as a magneto impedance that's basically the amorphous ribbon uh, uh, is related to ferromagnetic resonance and they showed you by a simple equations. And the, another paper uh, appeared in 2006 by Leonard Spinner et al. They suggested that the transverse permeability is the low frequency limit of ferromagnetic resonance. So you can use transverse permeability to investigate ferromagnetic resonance at low frequency. So for those interested, I suggest to go through this paper, very uh, nice work. Okay. Now, in the conventional experiment, basically both ESR and <coughs> ferromagnetic resonance was <coughs> studied using a single frequency spectrometer, usually at 9.5 gigahertz, like the one we shown. The sample is inside the cavity, microwave cavity, and it is uh, uh, it is at the maximum. It, it it fills the maximum field at the center. So, if when there is a Zeeman, because now you apply the magnetic field, there's a Zeeman splitting of uh, of the the electronic levels. So when the applied field energy is equivalent to the Zeeman splitting, then there'll be a power absorption by the sample because it causes the, the, the precision. So power absorption is maximum at the resonance uh, field. Usually in the experiment, the power absorption itself is proportional to the, the square of the amplitude of the, the AC field and proportional to mu double prime, okay? So in the EPR experiment like this, one uses modulation coil and then a lock-in amplifier, one actually gets dp by dh. So one gets the spectra something like this, okay, where the, the zero crossing point corresponding to the resonance field. Okay, so, so typically in our experiments also the same, the current is passed along this direction, the RF magnetic field is like this, so you should in principle see a resonance. Okay, but surprisingly until 1995, people have not seen Clearly, only this particular group, this by Barandier and all, the name sounds something like Mahindir, like my name. Uh, they, they see this behavior. They found this again in amorphous ribbon. Uh, they've actually measured only the total impedance. Most of the papers in amorphous ribbon, they do not separate out the real and imaginary part, unlike what we have done. They report only total impedance. The total impedance shows this nice behavior at low, low frequency. This at, uh, I don't know what is the frequency, maybe. Um, uh, maybe a few megahertz, I guess, they see a double peak, which you can see that it sort of increases, but then after certain frequency, about 1.5 gigahertz, it increases rapidly. And then they fitted this with the land for the Kettle's equation. They showed that actually what you see here is due to ferromagnetic resonance in the sample. So this is the first measurement of the electrical direction of ferromagnetic resonance in a bulk sample, okay? and which usually comes because of mu double prime shows a peak. Okay, so that's our uh, first uh, I, uh, impression that, okay, what we seen is basically connected with the ferromagnetic resonance. Okay, then we try to fit our data uh, using uh, uh, Lorentzians because our sample are not insulated, it's a metallic, and the skin depth plays the role. So, we have to consider this uh, uh, two two component two Lorentzians. One is the symmetrical part and the anti-symmetrical part. So this is shown for x equal to 0.3, which is a paramagnetic sample. So we can see a nice fit for uh, for these samples. And uh, this graph already is sort of explained. So here we plot this peak position, which I call now as the resonance field, which is the frequency, and uh, basically we fit to the Kittel's relation. Okay, and which this is, it's, it's a non-linear here at low frequencies as expected for a ferromagnetic material for this 0.1 and 0 0.05. But for 0 0.1, 0 0.3, which are paramagnetic, you can see they are linear. So the linear behavior implies that what we have seen is actually electron spin resonance in this material. So that's quite interesting. And the value of X, the gamma by two pi we get 
for x equal to 0.3, the value is 2.77 uh, megahertz per oyster. For a free electron, it's 2.8 megahertz per oyster. So it's close to the free electron value for x equal to 0.3, whose TC is much lower, 200 Kelvin, compared to 0.2, whose TC is around 240 Kelvin. Okay, so thus, thus we are sure that what we have seen is in some sample x equal to 0.2, 0.3 is due to electron spin resonance. And what we have seen in the other three compositions are basically to ferromagnetic resonance. But still, we were not satisfied. We went ahead and tried to use a borrowed um, uh, vector network analyzer from my colleague. So where we measured the power absorption directly. Okay. So what we did is that, again, this is not a, uh, not a uh, cavity setup. And uh, we are not very much experienced with the, the, the high frequency measurements before, but still we tried. So we took the sample and put, we wrapped the sample. Actually, we actually we made this a rectangular like plate with the copper. And then we connected to the, 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 the SMA connector to the, the network analyzer. And then we measured when the frequency is swept and, and frequency swept and under DC, different DC magnetic field, we measured the spectrum, like something what is shown here, but this is for the sample, which is just I have described. So this is the del P is the power absorption when the magnetic field is swept and the frequency is varied. So if you see that this is exactly similar to what we have seen in magneto resistance. And similar for x equal to 0.2 and 0.3, which are paramagnetic sample, we do clearly see a sharp peak for 0.2, but of course a bit less sharp peak for 0.3. So, and then we fitted this relation uh, to the uh, to the uh, modified uh, equations using Lorentzian uh, two Lorentzian fit, and we got this gamma value and so on. For particularly for 0.3 sample, again we get gamma equals to 2.87, close to 2.8 expected for a electron spin resonance. And thus we are conf we are very sure that what we have seen is due to magnetic resonance. Well, to be very sure again, we went to one more step ahead and then used this uh, cryo FMR setup, uh, this is the commercial setup, uh, which was uh, purchased by my groups uh, six months before. So we used this measurement uh, setup. So again, here, uh, the sample is uh, kept on a coplanar waveguide like this. So the current passing through this signal line creates the RF magnetic field. So this magnetic field interact with the sample magnetization. Okay, that is the basic principle. It's exactly similar to what I told that when the current is passed through the sample, it creates RF field. But in this case, you do not pass the current through the sample, but you keep the sample on the signal line. And what I show is that the derivative of the power absorption taken from VNA in the, in the blue color, sorry, in the red color and the, the power absorption, which is measured as a dp by dh with this cryo from our setup. Well, it obvious, if you see this graph, it obvious that they follow the same trend. Okay, and closely the peaks do match. So there's some small difference possible because of the magnetic fields and the PPMS and what we measure with the electromagnet, but otherwise you can see the same future. So this, this work was published in uh, uh, Journal of Material Science. Unfortunately, this was uh, rejected without even sending to the uh, uh, reviewer by physical review B. Okay, well, even before this, the first work on electrical detection of uh, magnetic resonance in these oxides were first reported by us. Uh, interestingly, in IC Magma conference held in Bhuneshwar in 2018, it took a long time for the paper to appear in 2019. And then we followed up this work, particularly with the calcium system, and which appeared in Applied Physics Letter with a very good reviews. And more recently, we moved beyond the manganite and went to the system, uh, lanthanum nickel manganese oxide, which is a ferromagnetic insulator, uh, which uh, the paper will be appearing soon in, in uh, JMM, where we show again, we use a room temperature FMR setup, which again made by us. Uh, and then we compare the results, which seems to be coincide, which is nicely matching. Okay, so all I told is that, well, we could detect ferromagnetic resonance and paramagnetic resonance with a simple setup by passing RF current. And we verified this by other two methods. One is vector network analyzer, another is the commercial cryo FMR setup. Okay, now still we are not convinced. What we have seen is the electron spin resonance. If, how can we see this, such a behavior in a very standard sample for EPR? 
Well, DPPH is a is an organic molecule, which is a standard uh, uh, standard marker for EPR spectroscopy because it has a lot the DP, the, it, the, 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 the DPPH, which is the, the two two diphenyl one picryl hydrazyl as as one unpaired electron, which is shared between 41 atoms. So the interaction between these electrons, basically it's a free radical on nitrogen. Is, is uh, the interaction between them is, uh, is, uh, non, is, is negligible. So because this sample is insulated, unlike the previous samples which we measured are metallic or, or low resistive sample, we cannot pass the current through the sample. So what we did is that we modified again, we had this uh, strip coil, then we had uh, the sample inside, then we measured this DPPH, we sort of press it into pellet and put it inside. We measured the resistance in reactants. Now you can see that the, the resistance shows a much, much sharper peak compared to what we have seen in manganites. And similarly, the reactant shows a, you know, the, the, this change, which is more like a dispersive behavior and R is like a you know, the absorption behavior. So this is like a mu double prime, and this is like a mu prime, or, or put it the other way, it's a chi double prime, which is because you are dealing with a paramagnetic sample, it is a chi double prime, and this is the chi prime behavior expected. So this graph shows this resistance peak nicely shifts with increasing frequency. And if you take this position, which is, I call it the resonance field, and the plot is as a function of frequency, it's the linear. And the linear fit shows gamma by 2 pi is 2.799, which is expected is 2.8 for, uh, for this uh, sample. So it's nicely fits. So we are very sure that what we observed here is again, the electron spin resonance uh, with, in the, in, with the DPPH and also in the other composition 0 0.1, 0 0.3 in the previous um, uh, samples I described. So we estimate the free radicals uh, concentration with this. I will not go into the detail. This work appeared in our, uh, the, the, this is RSC advances, the work you know, particularly done by Ushnish. Many of this work was done initially by Ushnish that are followed, by, uh, followed up by my other students and the postdocs. Okay, now this is a paramagnetic insulator. Now I go still one step ahead and investigate an insulator, but is which is neither paramagnetic nor ferromagnetic, but ferrimagnetic. Well, IG is a composition is a sample of interest nowadays because of uh, its potential application in a, in a magnonics. Okay, so this is a sample was obtained from Japan through our collaboration with the. Professor uh, Rajdeeps Rawat in NTU and his postdoc Rohit Medwal. So this is the egg grown on GGG substrate. So again, what we see here again because of the insulating sample we put inside our own setup this uh, strip coil and measure resistance and reactance. So you can see the resistance shows a very short peak. Now, in addition to these two short peaks at the point one cloister. You also see two additional small peaks. Okay, similar future also corresponding future also is available is, is seen in the export, like what is shown here. Okay, so we did angular dependence, uh, power dependence, and also a very detailed paper which appeared in ACS materials and interfaces uh, just last month. Uh, you can go through it in detail. Uh, so I just only give you the rough idea. So basically, what we have seen is that. When the frequency is increased from 500 megahertz to 2000 megahertz, we can see this. This uh, we focus here on the X spot. We can see that actually this dispersive behavior, where the field dispersive behavior occurs, shifts towards higher frequency, as like we have seen in the other compositions, as well. But also this interestingly, this low field behavior, which is sorry, I am not able to move it. This low field anomaly. Okay, so this is a very interesting aspect. So. So we do we did angular dependence as the power dependence and also one which uh, which which I don't go into the detail, and when we plot this frequency uh, resonance field both for low frequency low field behavior as well as the high field behavior, so it shows something like this. So when the DC magnetic field is applied along one zero zero direction, you can see the resonance frequency initially falls, and then it increases. Whereas when it's applied along one one zero direction. So it increases like this. So basically what we are seeing at low frequency here is due to the field below the anisotropic field. So we will be able to probe the magnetization dynamics 
which occurs here in this case below 800 megahertz uh, using our setup. Okay, so I, I won't go into the detail and uh, uh, we found that the, the anisotropic field is given by uh, obtained value 60 oil state and the, the damping parameter which got, which got was quite low 4.7 4 to 6.1 into 10 power minus four. And uh, this damping, this, this behavior, the, 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 uh, the line width as a function of frequency shows linear behavior only above 1200 uh, megahertz. Okay, at low field is a non-linear behavior. So the linear behavior is expected for the Gilbert damping. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, the main point is that the new modes which we see at low frequency is connected with the, the drag state, which is where the magnetization direction is constrained by magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Thus, our method can help to investigate the, the properties at uh, uh, below the magnetocrystalline, uh, below the anisotropic field. Okay. Well, so this is about the insulator. Now, again, another idea. Okay, instead of using the strip coil like we used, how about if I make a different behaviors? Like I make a different approach here where the egg is deposited on GGG, then we deposit <coughs> copper. Okay, instead of uh, having copper strip, I just have a copper electrode deposited on that. So you remember that this type of uh, studies are done for inverse spinol effect measurements usually, and also for spinol magnetic resistance. So the current is passed through now copper. So it creates RF field, at which interacts with the magnetization of the, the, the EEG. And what we observe, so, well, we observe, we didn't observe the same behavior we have seen because this is a different uh, example of a different thickness. But we see that again, very clearly double peak behavior was, which shifts up with increasing frequency. But there's also is some change. You can see that actually here it's a short peak, whereas if you increase to three gigahertz, this becomes more like a dispersive behavior, whereas the export more like a dispersive, uh, sorry, the absorption behavior, okay? So this is opposite to what we see at low frequency behavior, okay? So I will not go into the detail. So we fit this to against the Kittel relation. Our conclusion is that, which is we are preparing the manuscript to be submitted that actually we are investigating using this method, you know, AC spinol effect, which is much larger than the DC spinol effect in this system. Okay. So those who are interested, probably I can discuss later. Uh, finally, uh, there's a topic which is relevant to this is the, spin transfer torque or spin orbit driven ferromagnetic resonance. Well, a nice work was done by uh, several years before by Ashwin Tholaputkar uh, uh, on spin torque diode in magnetic tunnel junction. So, and, and he's doing a nice work even in India. Uh, so this work basically shows that, I mean, this is a taken, picture taken from Nature Materials, a review. Uh, basically, you pass a spin polarized current, suppose the free layer and the, uh, fixed layer magnetization are not aligned in the beginning when the polarizer current passes. So it transfers, polarizer current transfers, uh, it's a transverse momentum to the free layer, which can flip the direction of the free layer, like what is schematically shown here, which leads to the resistance oscillation. But because we use a diode here to rectify it, basically measures the DC voltage as a function of frequency. So you can see that they show behavior, something similar to what we have shown the DC magnetic resistance, the AC magnetic resistance. Okay. So similarly, nowadays, uh, uh, a lot of work is being done with this, uh, this type of system. You have uh, platinum, then you have permalloy and then oxide layer and permalloy people investigate the ferromagnetic resonance in this type, in this type of structure using inverse spinol effect. Okay. Uh, so in both the cases you measure the DC voltage at the end, whereas in our case, we measure the AC voltage. So what we want to know is that, will AC inverse spin hole effect or the AC spin hole magnetic resistance larger than the DC counterparts? So this is uh, something we want to investigate. But for that, of course, we have been working mostly on the bulk material so far, only in the last uh, six months, we are working on thin film. So we are looking for collaboration on thin film to investigate this uh, these aspects in more detail. So what is the role of spin transfer torque or spin orbit driven 
magnetic resonance through impedance measurement. Okay. And particularly whether we can get a giant AC spinol effect or AC spinol magnetic resistance. Okay, I think I'm coming to the conclusion. So in addition to that, as I mentioned that we also have a setup now, apart from VNA, we have a setup, particularly Ushnish has set up a lock-in amplifier based VNA, uh, the, the um, FMR measurement at room temperature. Uh, and then also we have a commercial spectrometer, which can go from 400 Kelvin to 10 Kelvin and up to seven Tesla. So we can measure, particularly for oxide samples, we really need a high magnetic field, unlike uh, you know, uh, the, the standard magnetic multilayers. So this setup is very essential for that reason. Okay, uh, so to summarize, so using a relatively simple experiment, okay, with just simple ideas, we have shown that colossal magneto resistance is possible in sub kilo field. Surprising that of the 30 years over, nobody else is doing similar work. Okay. However, to our, uh, to our disappointment, the low field CMR is not due to increase in mobility or decreasing scattering rate of the electron, but due to the suppression of the high frequency permeability and change in the skin depth and magnetic resonance. Okay. So this, this sort of we conclude after several other measurements. And using impedance analyzer, we not only detect ferromagnetic resonance, but also electron spin resonance which has not been reported by anyone so far using just an impedance analyzer to direct uh, the ESR. Okay, this is some, something is very, very, uh, my feeling is very exciting to me. Okay, we can investigate a number of systems uh, using this setup. Well, the scopes, low frequency ESR can be used to detect hyperfine splitting. People have used it in the past, of course, uh, using a different, uh, not really passing current through the sample, but using LC resonance circuits and other type of uh, modes uh, near zero field, uh, particularly indoor like experiment. And the FM, this low frequency FMR can be used to study magnetization dynamics uh, process within domains, not much of work uh, uh, even, uh, uh, even now in this direction, except for a few works uh, uh, on, on particularly in the below one gigahertz range. And we can investigate magnetization switching acoustical modes. Uh, we have the evidence for this in some of the work we are doing and uh, we investigate magnetization. We can investigate magnetization dynamics at the magnetic interfaces, which has not been explored so far. So with that, you know, probably uh, I will stop. So thank you for all. So I welcome collaborations. Okay, uh, particularly I have only two people in the lab, so I cannot make all the samples like what I was doing before. So I am now more open to collaboration. Of course, now I am more established lab compared to 10 years before. Okay, so with that, probably I'll stop. Thank you very much. Okay, Mahindran. So uh, Brad joins me in uh, clapping for your excellent talk. Uh, really a very vast spectrum of uh, things. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, let's take some questions. I see Puspendra has one question. Puspendra, would you like to ask or? Hello, sir. Uh, okay, you can ask your question. Sir, my question is uh, regarding this metal acid, metal city in uh, uh, yeah. manganites. Mm. So, uh, as you told that uh, if the spins are parallel in T2G state, then the uh, metal city is coming. Yeah. So, what is the driving force to make this spin parallel? Okay. First, the temperature. When the temperature is changed, as like in any other system, the T2G spins are uh, localized compared to the, the EG spins, the T2G spins order. Okay. The other possibility is that you can, because the EG electron is, is uh, spin polarized. So if you can pause the EG, the spins polarized recurrent, the T2G spin also can be polarized. Okay. So to answer the first, first it is driven by temperature. So it is also possible that the T2G spins can become anti-parallel. That is, one can go from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic state and the ferromagnetic to anti-ferromagnetic state, which, which is seen in certain compositions. So all driven by competition between the double exchange, which is ferromagnetic, super exchange, which is anti-ferromagnetic. There's another type of uh, super exchange, which is ferromagnetic. There are three competing magnetic interaction in the system. So did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kustendra. So, Sobik, please go ahead with your questions. Um, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, am I audible? 
Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is Shovek. I'm from the Tata Institute. So I had uh, two quick questions. So first about the manganites. Um, so I'm assuming those were polycrystalline samples or uh, yes, single crystalline? Uh, majority of the sample I investigated are polycrystalline, but the single crystal samples, I did investigate only one sample uh, that is uh, with the composition lanthanum 0.7 strontium point MnO3, but we did only the temperature uh, dependence that is below five megahertz. After that, uh, the sample was lost. Okay, okay. So my, I was uh, curious, like in your paramagnetic samples. And the, thin film, the... the question coming to you are this, in thin film, yes, Recently, we started collaboration with the Professor Venki and uh, Ariando's group in NUS. I, I think a okay. student uh, uh, is uh, here, uh, uh, Omar, uh, Ganesh Omar ji. Uh, so we got a similar results. Of course, we are we got a more interesting result uh, with thin films, which I didn't get time to discuss here. With I see, the, okay. magnetic thin films, yeah. Okay. So the related question to that was, um, so when you have this uh, gallium doping in the paramagnetic phase, do you see any evidence of super paramagnetism or anything like that? It's a good question, yes. For certain, uh, certain gallium content, we do super paramagnetic. We, we have seen, super, in fact, I explained on one of the papers, what we have seen is uh, due to super paramagnetism. <laughs> okay, so there you would- uh, the signal is a stronger, of... signal is stronger if it is super paramagnet rather than a complete paramagnet. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, the, so basically rest of your analysis in the, are on the samples where you don't see super paramagnetism. So that you... No, there, there, there are other compositions where I said told that even in the paramagnetic sample like the DPPH, right, right. Uh, yeah, we okay. do see a so clear you... signal. There is no doubt right. about that the, 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 mm -hmm. the setup I used is, is reliable. Okay, okay, okay. And, and yeah. is there any like uh, uh, thing about like oxygen vacancies? Because there are these reports of, you can get this very, uh, because of oxygen vacancy, you can get this very scattered mag like local magnetic moments, you know, in some sort of oxide films. Uh, I don't know if you yeah. have any I think the, thoughts that, about that. that something, or... uh, well, uh, we, we are actually investigating a very simple system, uh, particularly by my postdoc Rajasthi. We are taking lanthanum magnate, LAMNO3. We mm -hmm. are just doping with the sodium. Okay, sodium is a monovalent. Unlike strontium, it's a monovalent. So it 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 uh, it, uh, it, uh, it it double dopes holes. That means for one sodium, you create two Mn4 plus or two holes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in addition to that, we also create uh, uh, the vacancies, the oxygen, not right. actually vacancies, actually oxygen excess in the system. So the point is that we do see clear signal, paramagnetic as well as ferromagnetic in that. But to check whether this is coming from the oxygen vacancies or from this created uh, the Mn3 plus Mn4 plus, we have to do the temperature dependence. Okay. Unfortunately, at, at present I cannot do, but using the cryo FMR setup we have done, we could not see the difference. I see. Okay. So it, it will be quite interesting to take an oxide uh, where there's a vacancy, for example, barium titanate. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Titanium four Even plus strontium titanium, titanium, titanium three plus as one electron. We are investigating, but it's a room temperature. Its signal is too weak to see. I see. Okay. And so, just a quick last question. Uh, as you mentioned, cryo fMR. I was just curious, like for the gigahertz low temperature measurements, how do you calibrate the current that is uh, going into your sample? Oh, that uh, we already cal actually we send the samples to the company first to check. So these are all already have been uh, under the, uh, the uh, provide the the. the uh, the company which has sold this nano oscillator, they so actually it's already calibrated, like calibrated the, with the nickel. The network parameter with the nickel, yes. I see. Okay. Thank you. So if if people have the sample, I am willing to collaborate uh, because sure. this yeah. is I don't know how many people have currently this setup in India, but fortunately I was able to get it. It's completely operational. Yeah, I'll be very excited, but I'm just setting up my lab. So hopefully in a few. Fine. Weeks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, so Vic. Ganesh, please go ahead. Hi, Prof. Thank you so yeah. much for this insightful talk. Uh, I have just very simple question related to the skin effect which you talked about mm. in the bulk sample. So when you say about the skin effect for the materials related to LSMO and then cobaltate different materials, so what actually happened when you have a thin film? So in that case... Well, the skin, uh, the, for thin film, the skin effect is negligible. If uh, of course, at, the high, at much higher frequency, if you're going to 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, yes, probably it may play the role, but at lower frequency, like three gigahertz is negligible. Yeah, yeah. so for, for example, for the higher frequency cases. 
So does the impedance or which you see the, res the DC resistance and AC resistance will be different in that case also? In the, they are different. For example, we investigate the sample from your group. Yeah, we yeah. do see the behavior exactly similar to what we have seen in the bulk, except the futures are very short in thin film. Okay. Uh, uh, it's because the skin effect is not a problem. Okay. okay. And we, in addition, we also could see some additional future coming because of the, the anisotropy field, uh, the, the direction dependence and so on. Okay. So in fact, we don't want the skin effect to spoil our this thing. So we exactly. prefer to investigate thin film. <laughs> yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see no more questions from oh, Abhiru. Uh, please ask your question. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, I just uh, want to know in this lanthanum samples, the AC measurements, mm -hmm. uh, are they showing this percolation effect near the transition? The, the AC measurement, of, uh, yeah, yeah. well, we have, no. Uh, the AC measurement, what I'm seeing is that due to, whatever I'm seeing is due to change in the magnetic permeability. Okay, which is due to percolation or not, I cannot tell from the current measurement what we have. So we have to investigate the system where there's actually really percolation. But of course, in the manganites, it's known that many of the manganites do so percolation. Okay. I mean, it, it's, it, the peak is shifting in different different uh, way, like in DC and AC is at the opposite. Ah, that I say that that is the different, because even in a non-percolating system, the AC, uh, the, the 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 peak what you see in the AC susceptibility will shift towards lower temperature yeah. when the DC magnetic field is applied. That is because you are suppressing magnetic uh, spin fluctuation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this this is not related with the percolation. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I have a question, uh, Mahindra. Yeah. Uh, two three slides back, you showed this uh, like two modes. I think on y, uh, y yeah, Ig. Ig. Uh, Ig. Yeah. So uh, what is the origin of these two modes? The, the one mode is uh, due to the uniform mode, the one which you are seeing at a higher frequency, this one. Okay. It's due to the uniform Kittel mode. The lower frequency one, the one what you are seeing below 800 megahertz, okay. okay. and particularly close to the zero field, is due to the magnetization process below the Magneto below the anisotropic field. That is, the magnetization is not aligned along the field direction. So this can be investigated, uh, uh, further can be, you know, uh, can be exploited to investigate the magnetization switching. So what I'm telling you, this, this is due to, uh, I think I have to move the screen. So th this one is basically due to, uh, uh, to the, the magnetization dynamics below the anisotropic field. Okay. So, so basically, it can uh, give information about the magnetization dynamics within domains, or, or it can be influenced. It is influenced by magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Yeah. So, so which is which is which is lacking in the current literature. Okay, because uh, they do not investigate at the lower frequency range. Okay. So it is like some kind of misalignment, you can say, yes, yes, the yes. Domain, yes. which is making a second mode of precision, isn't it? Exactly. So that sounds very exciting. Yeah. Hope you understand. I think that there, there are a lot of scope uh, to investigate many aspects in this thing, which I don't think that I have understood everything. This. No, oh, that's <laughs> that is yeah. good. that's good. So good, nice results. Uh, okay. Are there other questions from anybody? Otherwise, uh, we can wrap up. I do not see. I think uh, everybody is happy. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mahindran. So Raja and myself, we'd like to sincerely thank for your efforts to give this webinar. All of you, uh, thank you for thank joining. Thank you and uh, for your colleagues. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. I have been listening to most of the talks except for a few. Yeah, so next week, uh, Saros Das will give his talk. Okay. So I hope many of you will join. And um, until then, please uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Mahindra. Okay, thank you. We'll talk later. Okay. Yes, we will we'll talk, talk later. We have something yeah. to talk. Right. So, yeah. good night. Good night. Yeah, bye. Okay, bye.